Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I'm here privileged to present Senate Bill 897 regarding the Workers' Compensation Act. 897 provides a narrow extension of workers' compensation benefits to police and firefighters who to provide an additional year of healing time for those who were catastrophically injured at the hands of another in the line of duty, an additional year of healing time. Under current law, Labor Code Section 4850, police officers and firefighters, as you may know, are eligible for up to one year of leave without loss of salary when they are temporarily disabled due to injury. Understanding that this may not be enough time to recover for some of the worst injuries that these men and women unfortunately receive, Senate Bill 897 would extend coverage very narrowly for certain exceptional in injuries. As amended, catastrophic injury at the hands of another is narrowly defined to include only three types of injuries that occur in the line of duty. These are severe burns, severe bodily injuries resulting from a building collapse, and severe bodily injuries resulting from a shooting or a stabbing, uh, as we recently had in the city of Riverside. <coughs> From the beginning, the Riverside Police Officers Association and I have committed to narrowly tailoring 897 to ensure that costs to local agencies are kept to a minimum, and we will continue to do so uh, moving forward. When a police officer or a firefighter is catastrophically injured, special accommodations must often be made at the local level to prevent the injured from losing their pay and benefits. Under Senate Bill 897, those who receive this benefit will not have to endure the political process of receiving their pay while they heal with the intent of returning to work. Um, I should note that I have reviewed the analysis and the suggestions, staff suggestions in the analysis are, are completely valid. I intend to continue to work to make this as narrow a bill as possible to deal only with those uh, officers and those firefighters who are catastrophically injured as a result of an extraordinary set of circumstances. I will be working this bill, uh, assuming it moves out of this committee, and continuing to work it to make sure that it, it is as narrow as possible while dealing with uh, this particular injury, set of injuries. Senate Bill 897 is supported by police officer and firefighter asso associations. I respectfully ask for your I vote, but before we get to that, I have uh, some gentlemen here from the Riverside Police Department and the Riverside uh, Police Officers Association to provide uh, some testimony and perhaps answer questions. Brian Smith, Aurelio Melendrez, and most importantly, Andrew Takius. Wonderful. Okay, witnesses and support. Uh, my name is Brian Smith. I'm the president of the Riverside Police Officers Association, and I'm also a sergeant with the Riverside Police Department. Uh, when we uh, approached this issue uh, with Senator Roth, it was clearly because we had an individual in mind, and that is the man to my right, Andrew Takius. Um, Andrew is here today. He will discuss and answer any questions that you may have about his injury and his recovery. Um, and he's been doing that on a regular basis. And if he's not comfortable with the question that you ask, he's going to politely tell you he's, he's choosing not to answer that. But he's very open into the recovery process. So for us, what happened was uh, when Andrew was injured on February 7, 2013, his partner died next to him in a police car. Mm -hmm. He was shot nine times by an assault rifle by a man whose name does not bear repeating uh, going forward. But uh, we could have lost two officers that night, and in this instance, Andrew was rushed to the hospital where he started his three-year-long recovery process. It was pretty clear after the first year that Andrew was in no condition to have an assessment made on whether or not he could completely recover from these injuries, um, and, and he can talk about that as well. But we approached our city council and, and our city government and said, hey, we don't we'd like to see Andrew stay and have an opportunity to see if he can actually return to work. I mean, that's really what workers' compensation benefits are about. It's, mm -hmm. it's the injured worker, but it's also geared towards rehabilitation and the ability for the worker to come back to work if he or she chooses to do so, and they can perform at a level that's acceptable to the employer. In Andrew's case, like I said, after the first year, he would not have been, he was in no condition to have that assessment made, and mm -hmm. under current law, he would have been forced to accept a disability retirement um, and have his doctors forced to make a determination on what his level of disability was then. Fast forward two years, Andrew has now returned to work for the Riverside Police Department. He's working in a modified capacity, but he is at work every day, six to eight hours a day, minus his uh, uh, therapy sessions and so on and so forth. And I, for one, think that uh, the mental aspect of him coming back to work and being around the men and women that supported him during that time frame has increased his ability to recover from these wounds. So retroactively, I can't go back and fix what Andrew's process was through the state workers' comp system, but I can hope 
that anyone that becomes injured as a result of something that Andrew experienced similar to that, there's an opportunity for them to, to go that second year. Um, many of you may remember that the old workers, co uh, workers Comp 4850 time legislation did allow for two years of an injured worker. Um, and that was a slip and fall, a, a traffic collision, a, a gun, you know, recovering from a gunshot. That's not what we're looking for. Um, and when I talked to the senator, I, I told him one of the things that I felt was important to get traction was we need to be very narrow in scope and focus. It needs to be traumatic. Um, and what that term becomes, I'm not sure. As a guy with a high school diploma, <laughs> I, I don't know. I probably have a different range than what a doctor would. But the fact that uh, somebody did it to a worker, in this case a public safety officer, um, Andrew didn't chose to be shot that night. And Mike Crane's wife and family didn't choose to be widows and, and fatherless children. But it happened. And Andrew, his experience, I think, as he talks to you about it, if you have questions, and, and he'll make a statement, it'll highlight the importance of the additional uh, recovery. And I'm thankful for our city for doing what they did for Andrew. I'm thankful for uh, Senator Roth, obviously, for seeing that this is an important issue as well, and the committee giving us the time uh, to, to make the presentation to you. So if you have any questions of me, feel free to ask. And otherwise, uh, I have Andrew Takius for you. Thank you. Andrew, please proceed. Thanks for having me today and taking your time to listen to me. I started my career in law enforcement in 2009 for the city of Inglewood. In 2012, I came to the city of Riverside. Uh, I started a three-week orientation phase, and then I did three weeks of patrol before I got injured. Uh, my partner next to me got shot, and he died. Um, and that night that I got injured, that's relatively the time 4850 started. Uh, I was in the cast both arms. Uh, I needed help eating, uh, getting out of bed, uh, bathing. Uh, it wasn't until June that my arms became free from the casts. I had severe nerve damage and my hands flopped like this. Uh, the only way my hands would open is if they were bent in. Three years later I, I could open my hands like this. In the summer of 2013, I did a test called an EMG. I can't tell you what it stands for, but it's a nerve test. And uh, the report said that my nerves weren't going to recover and that function wasn't going to come back. Uh, so they put me in these splints on both hands uh, and keep the wrists up to keep the tendons from overstretching um, so that the doctor could repair them eventually. The doctor said, we want to wait until a year hits to do any surgery to see if there is any um, nerve repairs just from the body naturally doing it. In November of 2013, which is nine months after I got injured, I was able to start moving my hand a little bit like this. Um, as each month went on, my fingers started to move. And then into 2014, that's when they did the first tendon transfer. I did tendon transfers on both arms, and what that does is it makes the lift the wrists lift and do what the nerves are supposed to do. Um, I've had repeated surgeries on those tendon transfers just to tighten it up and clean out scar tissue. Uh, let's see, now 20, 2015, I start to get a little stronger. I'm working on doing push-ups. Uh, but when I do that, shrapnel surfaces to the skin and it, it causes a lot of nerve pain for me. I, I could get through my day fine, but it limits my functions. And so I've had two surgeries in the last six months just to rem remove the shrapnel. Uh, what I want to say to you guys is it would be tough at the time that I got injured to be 28 years old and retired. Mm -hmm. uh, I, went, you know, I went to college, I worked hard, and this is a career I wanted. And there's no, no way I would have been able to come back in that year point in even two years. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, the city of Riverside worked with me, and uh, they gave me a job doing uh, background investigations. It is a job I can do just fine. I don't have any complaints, and I get through the day fine. And so I would hope that I could be an example for you guys of why we should extend the 4850 time from where it's at right now. So if you guys have any questions for me, I'd <coughs> just feel free to ask. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing your story. It's very powerful. I really appreciate that. Um, you want to ask a You want to face testimony? You want to ask directly? Uh, just want to talk to Andrew. Just, but first, of all, I want to thank you for your service. And uh, when the incident happened, uh, 
and we learned of this uh, tragedy, you, you remained in our family's uh, prayers for a, rec a full recovery. And I'm, I'm so delighted um, that at 28 years old, uh, that you weren't just written off uh, and disabled by the department, and you have successfully set your mind to be rehabilitated. You've been there and you've come back, and it, it's it's a wonderful testimonial, uh, and and, sh and shows the the importance of this bill that we have to to give our our heroes, our public safety heroes, an opportunity when they've been injured on the job to be able to recover and to resume your your the career that you love. And, and I want to applaud uh, Senator Roth uh, for, for bringing this forward and, 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 and the narrow scope that you've identified. Senator, thank you for bringing it forward. And if I may, I'd love to be a co-author with you on this bill. And um, uh, Andrew, t tell us a little bit more about your, your rehabilitation. I, and, I, and I also want to commend the Riverside Police Department because I, th I, I think you'll agree and you're very modest in mentioning it, but they have been very supportive of seeing you through this rehabilitative process to help you get back on your feet and you're absolutely right at, you're not ready to retire at 28 years old and obviously you have to have your faculties because we want you, you to be able to protect yourself because it's, there's some dangerous people out there as we know but can you talk about your experience with the Riverside Police Department and your rehabilitative process and and and, and the two year talk about the two-year time period how uh, this would have eased your anxiety as you had to comprehend this horrific tragedy that seeing your partner uh, being murdered right in front of you is traumatic enough. I, I don't know how I could recover in two years from that, so. Well, I, I spent 18 days in the hospital. Uh, I was nervous when they told me that my lung was bruised. And my lung didn't get hit, but it was just the velocity of being shot with a rifle. When they sent me home after 18 days, I. I was like, why are you guys sending me home? I'm in more pain now than when I left. Uh, I pretty much laid in bed for six months. I ended up gaining 63 pounds. Anyone that wasn't in my inner circle, I cut them out. And I, I just think that was with going through depression and the weight gain, I was, you know, I was embarrassed about it. Uh, I spent most of my days sitting outside, just listening to music. When the year ran out, I had to sign up for health insurance. And so I went through um, Covered California to do it. Uh, when the city found out what, that my year was out, uh, what they ended up doing is going to city council and voting me back in to stay as a sworn peace officer on the books. And my job was to just recover and just check in with people. Um, since then, they, they've been meeting with me and talking about, we'd like to get you back, what are you interested in doing? Uh, you know, I would take whatever I can get. And so they brought me into personnel, and uh, they've accommodated all my uh, limitations. Um, and I just feel like they've done an outstanding job. And so... You know, now I'm 30 years old, uh, I have a job and I get benefits and uh, I can move forward. Uh, I feel more confident in myself today than I did right after I got injured. And uh, I feel like I'm still progressing and moving forward. Well, God bless you. Uh, I'm delighted to move the bill. And if there's any other senators who would like to ask any questions Do or comments. Oh, well, is there any, uh, any other uh, uh, pro 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 proponents of the bill? Yeah. Anybody else who wants to speak about the bill? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Christy Bauma, on behalf of the California Professional Firefighters, uh, we're honored to be co-sponsors of this measure and we're honored by the service of this officer. Um, I think actually he describes the plight of many injured workers um, feeling isolated, depressed, um, and desperate to get back to work. So I think this is the right policy um, at the right time. And the real only policy question before you is do you want families to continue to suffer under financial hardship mm -hmm. by having to trigger away from their 4850 protection while they're trying to fight to get back to work. The issues brought up by the opposition, you'll hear them again. The tax status issue is a completely separate and unrelated discussion. Uh, medical treatment decisions should still be controlled by the physicians that see these injured workers, not by an employer meeting and conferring with an injured worker to convince them that they should just not return to work at 28 years old or 35 years old if they are impassioned and, and, and striving to recover and return to work. Uh, so I, 
I urge caution at any further refinements. I think this is very a very narrow bill, and it is a very worthy adjustment uh, to our process to support, you know, I represent the firefighters, the brothers and sisters in law enforcement uh, when they suffer such traumatic and tragic injuries. We urge your support. Thank you for your advocacy on that. Any others, uh, proponents? Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, members, Matthew Seiberling on behalf of the Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, the Los Angeles Police Protective League, and the Riverside Sheriff's Association on support. Thank you for your testimony. Any other proponents of the bill? If not, I'll invite opponents to the bill to come forward. Association of Counties. I'll keep this really brief. We are in opposition to the bill. I did want to thank the author and his staff for meeting with us uh, when the bill was first introduced to hear our concerns and uh, start working together to, to uh, narrow the bill. Like I said, we're still in opposition mainly due to uh, the cost pressure that it would place on local governments, the fact that um, when the officer doesn't return to work, we do have to back them up with other pa public safety officers um, and pay more overtime. So we do have an issue with that cost pressure on local governments. Um, also, while I noted that the author did narrow the bill, the definition of severe in the bill is, is not actually defined. That could leave local governments open to litigation on what does severe mean? When, do, when does this extra year 4850 apply? Um, but knowing that the bill is a work on progress, work in progress, uh, we would like to continue working with the author on uh, narrowing it further um, and uh, seeing where we go with that. So with that, um, we're in opposition. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning, Chair Members. Dane Hutchings with the uh, uh, League of California Cities. I'll keep my comments brief as well as um, um, my comments align with, with CSAC. Um, really, I'm, I'm here just to testify specifically on, um, as the supporters mentioned, uh, the fantastic work of the City of Riverside. Um, the City of Riverside did um, uh, work extensively with the officer and is continuing to work with the officers as, uh, as cited. Um, um, and we commend them for, do, for doing that. Um, I think what's important to note is that there is nothing stopping local governments from already doing this, um, applying a, a state mandate for every local government to do this. Uh, we feel it's not the right approach, um, allowing um, cities like the city of Riverside to work directly with the uh, officers uh, should they be injured. Um, to get them uh, back to work is, is what we feel is best, uh, specifically due to uh, the cost concerns. Um, so we do believe that this decision should be made uh, left to the local agency on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you for your testimony. Question, Senator? Quick question Mitchell. with regard to Riverside. Perhaps, um, Senator, you're the best to answer it. Did Riverside uh, um, in, in bore the full cost of the city council funded uh, the additional support for the officer for a year? It's my understanding. Because the staffing levels are set in Riverside at a particular level and they continued to utilize this officer's slot to take care of mm -hmm. the officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in listening to the uh, opposition, if, if we were to allow cities to make the decision on their own, then the individual cities would have to bear that cost. Well, that's my understanding, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't know how other cities are structured. I would imagine the city would make mm -hmm. a decision whether or not uh, the city police department could do without uh, that particular uh, mm -hmm. officer in the field if mm -hmm. the officer's duties were limited to uh, desk duties only and, and act accordingly. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I just want to make a couple of remarks that uh, and I appreciate the municipalities that are here. Uh, that certainly you can volunteer to take care of uh, injured public safety officers the way the city uh, of Riverside has. Um, but your, your, your chief uh, criticism of, of the bill is financial. And I believe that when you have uh, public safety officers, whether they're police, uh, um, fire, um, lifeguards, uh, when these people put their lives on the line for us every single day and by no fault of their own become severely injured and have a chance to be rehabilitated and brought back on, 
um, and, and coming from local government, I, I understand there is a financial impact, but, but I'm going to err on the side of trying to make sure that our public safety officials uh, are, our, our public safety officials are, are given the appropriate uh, treatment to try to return them to uh, the job. Um, so um, I appreciate the, the fiscal impacts, but uh, this is why we have reserves in, in counties and cities. And, uh, and I'll tell you that as an elected official for 24 years and being associated with the California League of Cities and the National uh, and uh, California Association of Counties, um, there have been some municipalities that uh, didn't do the right thing on behalf of injured officers that I've been aware of. And uh, some, some terrible examples that, uh, of how they were treated and actually had to hire legal counsel to uh, not only get the health care that they deserve, but to also preserve their jobs. So anyway, uh, any other opponents at this time? Yeah, briefly, uh, Jonathan Feldman with the California Police Chiefs Association. We are, uh, appreciate the intent, but we are opposed. Our smaller agencies have gone through the situation where officers have been injured. Uh, I received an email from the city of Grover Beach where they have 19 officers on duty, six are currently injured, and their city will not backfill to replace any of those officers. So they're down almost a third of their officers that are, their main job is to police and protect the city, but how can you do that when a third of your officers are on injured reserve? So um, incredibly sympathetic to officers that face this situation. Um, the officer here to testify, incredibly sympathetic to his story. I uh, have been very appreciative of the conversations we've had with Senator Ross' office, and we'll continue to make sure that we can uh, take care of our officers, but also make sure that we can uh, maintain the public safety of the communities we serve. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Uh, Dylan Gibbons with the California Special Districts Association, representing over 1,000 special districts, including uh, fire districts, police protection districts, community service districts. Uh, also, in, in opposition, I want to align my comments with that of uh, CSAC and League of Cities and uh, look forward to working with the author's office to narrow the bill going forward. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Jason Schmelzer here on behalf of the California Coalition uh, on Workers' Compensation, respectfully opposed to the bill. Also want to commend the author's office for uh, the very positive conversations we've had them, with them in the past. So, thank thank you. you for your testimony. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Paul Gonzalez representing the cities of Rancho Cucamonga, Redding, and Torrance, we'd like to align our comments with the police chiefs. Small cities uh, causes some, some problems for us, but look forward to working with the author moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any further questions of Senator Leno? Senator Roth, first of all, thank you for recognizing the bill San Francisco's unique status in this debate. And I think that the comment was well taken. I, uh, uh, suspect you're open to attending to the definition of severe. We are, we are actively working that. Right, because I think that is a real question to be resolved. And then can I just uh, assume that the listed opposition of the State Sheriff's Association would be for the same or similar reason to the police chiefs? I assume so, Senator. Because that took me a bit by surprise, uh, though I clearly understand the concerns of the League of Cities and mm -hmm. the uh, of CSAC. But uh, the State Sheriff's Association uh, did catch my eye. So with that, I'm pleased to move the bill. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, if you'd I may. Would you like to close? No, I, I, let me just note, I mean, it's workers' compensation cases and injuries, particularly in law enforcement and fire. I mean, it's easy to talk about injuries in general, small cities, smaller counties. But I have to say, this is not about back injuries, this is not about leg injuries, this is not even about cardiac injuries. This is about a very, very narrow set of circumstances. And I venture to say, if each of you think about your own communities and your own experiences, think about how many of these cases where an officer or a firefighter uh, is so catastrophically injured, whether it's through gunshot wound or falling through the roof of a burning building, that they are unable to either return to work within the year of the 4850 benefits, or they're declared permanent and stationary, to use the workers' comp term, permanently disabled and retire at the end of that one year. This is designed to take care of those very narrow. Fortunately, these types of cases do not happen in the state of California very often, and I've challenged both the 
proponents and the opponents to come to me and give me a total. And frankly, no one is able to even identify very many of these cases in the state. So this, is, this bill is designed to deal with those very narrow, a very narrow, narrow set of cases where you have officers who, were, who remain temporarily disabled at the end of the 4851st year who are struggling, who do not want to give up, who want to fight to regain their jobs. And I don't personally think, and I've yet to see any real evidence of it, that this is going to create a substantial financial burden on any city or any <coughs> county uh, in the state of California, fortunately, because we don't have that many of these cases. So with that, I'd respectfully ask for your I vote. And this is going to be referred to? It's going to the floor. Going to the floor. Mm -hmm. Roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. The motion is due pass. Mendoza? Stone? Aye. Stone, I. Jackson? Leno? Hi. Leno, I. Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, I. Can we leave the roll open? Yeah, so we need to leave the roll open. We're going to leave the roll open and uh, center. <coughs> 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 